Hello, everybody. This is the third day of our AMR conference, uh, summer edition. So happy to have you all here for this day in which we want to discuss everything around pool incentives and policy environment for, for AMR. Um, we have a, a broad panel of experts uh, for this session. Unfortunately, our moderators still have some trouble to join this session. But um, we can start anyway with, with our experts first and then try to bring her back. So our first um, speaker in this, uh, our first uh, two speakers of this session uh, will be um, presenting some results that has been done uh, under the work of the Global AMR R&D Hub. It will be um, Enrico Baradi and uh, Kalin Matar. Um, they will present um, then the major results. Um, so we will try to bring them in now and to make her presentation ready. So hello to you both. So actually, I should not be the moderator of the session, but <laughs> luckily you are there and you can take over for the for the first part um, to bring in your insights. So. Don't know if you see your presentation already. If so, I can see it now. Okay. <laughs> so then uh, I will hand over to you so that you can start. And in the meantime, we will try to bring Casey in. Okay. Perfect. And, uh, and for everybody, um, uh, we will have a panel discussion at the end of uh, the, the first presentation. So keep all your questions, put them in the chat, and then we will come back later. Okay. So go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sandra, for the invitation and for um, the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, my name is Khalid Matar, and uh, along with my colleague um, Enrico Baraldi, we will be talking to you today um, about um, the recent report that was just released um, from the Global AMR R&D Hub. Um, So um, the title of the report is Estimating Global Patient Needs and Market Potential for Selected Health Technologies Addressing Antimicrobial Resistance. It was published just last week after two years of work. Um, so we're definitely happy um, about that. And it's uh, freely available online at the link that, that you can see. We're going to try to take you through the major findings and the policy recommendations um, here very shortly. Um, so just to uh, tell you a little bit about how um, we came about to do this work and then what are the methodologies that we used for those numbers that you are going to hear. Um, so um, we have quantified um, market potential for four priority health technologies. Um, so forecasting both patient need as well as market attractiveness. So as a first step, um, the expert advisory group, or as you're going to see it on, on the slide as EAG, um, we came together and through a very iterative process, um, including some observers, some um, colleagues from the WHO um, and other interested members, some of you may have um, answered our survey and that was back in 2019. Um, we were able to prioritize um, based on patient need uh, or priorities um, for um, different technologies. So those were two um, therapeutics, gram-negative, uh, multidrug resistant um, small molecules um, that would be given intravenously. One is to target the bloodstream infection syndrome, and the second one is to target pneumonia um, for diagnostics. And this will look familiar because um, they match quite a bit with the TPPs that were um, released around that time by the World Health Organization. Um, first one um, is a point of care test to um, differentiate between bacterial versus other causes of infection. Um, and the other um, diagnostic would be one to identify uh, pathogen ID and uh, susceptibility in a rapid fashion. Um, the second, um, we also had prioritized a few others, but the decision uh, given time constraints and then um, resources by the board of the hub was to limit our study to these four. So in phase three, um, we had a consultant um, or consultancy group that helped us with numbers, projections, et cetera. So this is, um, 
under the guidance of the EAG, of course. This is when they um, did most of that work in phase three and four. Uh, number one, they uh, quantified needs, so the epi side of things um, for the um, antibiotic products. Um, we used 13 countries. Those were expanded to 22 countries. Um, as you can imagine, um, we have quite a bit of paucity of data. We did our best um, to use whatever data was available from different sources to um, derive our um, epi projections. Um, and then um, the same thing was done for 21 countries um, for the diagnostics. Um, then for revenue um, generations, um, top-down methodologies for um, the um, antibiotics and then bottom-up for, for the diagnostics. And you're gonna hear a little bit more or quite a bit more about those um, at, during our presentation. Um, and then this is um, where we are now. We've reviewed the results, we've made policy recommendations and we published that report. Um, so I will be talking to you about the EPI side um, and the EPI projections and, and Professor Beraldi will be taking us through um, the revenue side of things um, here real shortly. Um, so as far um, as uh, approaching antibiotic um, patients. Um, this is exactly what we did, what I was mentioning with bottom-up approach. Um, we had an annual um, all-cause syndrome incidence, um, then hospitalized more severe because remember we are talking about IV uh, molecules. Um, and then um, the cases that were attributed to bacteria only ones um, that were, were attributed to MDR or resistant cases. Um, and then um, this is how we got to the MDR cases per path pathogen. Um, the XDR and, and, and uh, um, DTR ones was a different, a bit of a different conversation. For all purposes, we we have um, talked about MDR um, in our report. Um, so, as far as the diagnostic patients, um, for uh, the total number eligible for diagnostic one, as a reminder, this is the point of care testing. Um, we had. Um, or the numbers that were used uh, were based on um, actual um, visits um, for, for care, so formal um, numbers of visits. Um, and then that took the United States, high income countries, upper middle income countries, low middle income and low income countries were um, lumped together, um, as you can imagine, because of the difficulty um, getting numbers for these. And this is how we estimated uh, patient needs. So primary care consultations um, were um, the basis of this analysis. Uh, we certainly understand that uh, this uh, has some limitations based on prior experiences with use of point of care testing, but this was truly uh, the main um, method that we were able to identify to be able to quantify those. And something that I'm pretty sure um, most of you here um, already realize, but just to put this into perspective and give you some numbers. So MDR, gram-negative BSI, and pneumonia currently represent about 16% and 6% of the total estimated annual all-cause incidence for each of these symptoms. However, when we look at the projections from 2040, we'll see that there will be about 48% increase um, the uh, prevalence of MDR, gram-negative gram BSI, and about 65% um, in the increase in the MDR gram-negative gram um, pneumonia. Something that you may also already know is that as of right now, we already see high MDR burdens in all income groups. Um, Acinetobacter baumannii is the culprit right now in, um, in most um, of the countries that you can see over there. Um, but um, we already see quite a bit of resistance in, in Pseudomonas, as you can imagine, um, in Klebsiella, um, and a little bit to a lesser extent um, to, to E. coli. So um, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Kleb forecast to remain the top three MDR gram negative causing bacteria. So as far as infections in general, all the way out to, uh, to 2040, if you look at the differences or the split between pneumonia and BSI, certainly this, um, this changes a little bit, but um, they still remain in, in top three. So um, as of right now, and this will continue, um, the burden of MDR gram negative infections disproportion disproportionately falls outside of high income countries, and it's going to worsen considerably by 2040, as I showed you here really shortly. Um, so why currently the burden falls in a few LMICs, and we think of India as the biggest player, in this group, we are going to see um, other people kind of catching up and contributing more equally to this burden by 2040. 
The current commercial model of access is forecast to greatly diminish in its ability and effectiveness to meet the global need, leading to a worsening access over time. And I think that, you know, pretty clear um, where the, the burden is going to continue and increase significantly. Um, and while in high income countries, um, MDR gram negative infections are going to increase most certainly, and as, as we showed, um, potentially up to a point where one in three infections may be MDR, um, but the fragmentations of so few patients in absolute terms spread across so many countries is a costly and diminishingly attractive propositions for increasingly smaller companies. Um, so people who can pay are a very small proportion or in the current model who can pay. Um, and as you can imagine where the patient need is uh, significantly um, bigger, how do we, um, how do we reconcile um, all of this? And I will hand it over to uh, Professor Baraldi to take us over. Thank you very much, Colleen. Uh, yeah, I will now take you through what is the implication in terms of revenues of those figures that you've seen in terms of needs. And unfortunately, I can already anticipate that there is a huge disconnect between needs and actual revenues. I'm however jumping over the methodological details as Kalina has already mentioned them. And I want to focus on the figures we got, starting first of all from the two therapeutics. And in this slide, you can see on top here at this mark of $700 million yearly, what we can consider a sort of threshold for commercial viability for an antibiotic when reaching, reaching peak year sales. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the current existing market for the nine or so um, gram-negative intravenous antibiotics, branded ones out there, they don't even reach that mark. We're about at $500 million. And that's already something that should be worrying us. And when we look, go and look at the current products out there, we can see that the most successful product out there, um, it's uh, way below this marker, of course, but our two products, uh, let's call them our, uh, let's say, hypothesized or proposed products, the BSI and the pneumonia product, when they will be launched, of course, they will have to face competition and they will conquer only a small market share in this market to the level where the BSI product will not go over when reaching peak year sales 11 years after launch, we're talking about 2036, of only $184 million. And if we look at pneumonia, it will only reach $127 million. And of course, these are very unattractive figures when it comes to making decisions about even continuing or even more starting to develop this kind of products. If we look instead at the diagnostic revenues, the situation is slightly better. However, probably not fully sufficient to motivate full uh, actions and investments on that side. Nonetheless, here we reach for the first diagnostic, you have it here in year 2040, about 15 years after launch, about $400 million in revenues. Uh, the, and this is the more simple kind of diagnostics, the one that could be placed ideally also on um, uh, yeah, any kind of uh, point of care versus the other kind of diagnostic, which is more sophisticated, the pathogen ID and accessibility product, which could be possibly placed on a more sophisticated type of uh, uh, clinic and receptions. And in this case, the forecasted revenues are lower, 3,433. Uh, dollars and uh, we're talking about uh, um, a more complex product which uh, is more difficult to uh, diffuse and spread in certain type of healthcare system most likely of course low and middle income countries what is interesting is however that here it's possible to think about different scenarios and we did uh, uh, direct calculations and examples to try and see what could be the result if we would uh, have a more favorable distribution uh, for the first type of diagnostic, the simple uh, bacteria versus other theology, we could see that uh, it's quite easy to increase sales uh, up to 
2.8 billion, and that would make it definitely an attractive economic proposition. We can talk more later on about what could be this kind of interventions, whereas for the other type of diagnostics, it's more difficult to achieve this kind of uh, increase in sales. And also the favorable scenario which we modeled wouldn't bring so much effect, much due to the fact that it remains a complex technology, not easy to use in all um, healthcare settings. And now over to Colleen for a comment on this uh, geographic uh, disconnect about between revenues and sales and needs. Absolutely. Thank you, Enrico. So um, very quickly, um, also something that we have alluded to on uh, two occasions already, um, high income countries where 70% of the revenues are located um, relatively low demand in fragmented across about 70 plus countries where we have the grow the most the highest growing need and already uh, most of the need about 92 percent um, we currently do not have any significant um, models or tools or or even abilities to um, uh, to truly um, either develop innovation um, or um, look into further as of right now um, um, either financing or, or countries coming together um, at this point. So we have a place where we are asking um, companies, developers to produce um, or new drugs. Um, but at the same time, um, the people who have the highest need as of right now cannot access them. Yet at the same time, we are asking for stewardship. We are asking for um, um, companies um, to to accept the fact that, that we would like to conserve those drugs um, for um, the cases um, that or where the um, where the drug is absolutely needed. So we have a significant this ge geographical disconnect. We have a significant disconnect um, in um, the ability or hoping the ability to market um, and to distribute the drug um, as um, widely as possible because this is um, obviously something that that we would not really want to see um, on the on the AMR um, side of things. Um, so I think I'll, I'll uh, leave it uh, to Enrico um, at this point. Thank you very much. And now let's delve a little bit into what are the root causes of that disconnect. Basically, why are uh, revenues so limited? And there are basically two types of problems, at least in the way we model the issue. Basically, sales derive from price times uh, volume of uh, um, either machines or um, drugs sold. And that's within the current uh, setting and the wage revenues are generating, which means before introducing any kind of pool incentive, especially the linked such. But still, we need to work uh, inside that framework. And basically, looking at the price side of the equation, we have the problem that the drugs being launched uh, still cannot differentiate themselves from others. They cannot claim superiority. In that sense, it's problematic to demand higher prices. Moreover, there is also high, strong competition with already nine or so products out there. And this tends to depress, of course, the price of the, any new product being launched. Looking at the volume side, of course, we have, which is a positive element, the stewardship um, uh, interventions, the limiting the use of antibiotics. But we also have the fact that demand is highly fragmented, which means pops up um, in small volumes in every single country. This means that uh, if we look at these two drivers, volumes and price, we can at least try to do some simulation or, or scenario analysis. And looking at the price, we didn't really uh, propose any specific way of, on how to increase price, but we look at the quantity. How much should price increase in order to reach the 700 million, let's call it uh, sustainability threshold from an economic point of view? And if all countries, including in our analysis, 70 plus, would increase the price, then they would need to increase it by about seven, six times the price of antibiotics. And you can understand that this is a pretty tough proposition if you consider all countries around the globe. If you instead stick only to 10 countries, those with the highest income, then you could reach the 700 million revenues for the, that product that we're focusing on, but it would require in, increasing the price by about 11 times. And that's already a tough proposition. So price would be problematic to use. Looking at the volume, well, of course, we don't want to do anything about stewardship, but something could be done in terms maybe of uh, 
pulling together demand or in terms of obtaining products that could reach a higher market share, maybe because they can be fully differentiated. And if a product were to reach 30% market size, that share, then it would reach the 700 million market thresholds from the current low volumes under the 200 million. But unfortunately, it's also equally possible that in the future, the specific product being launched would experience, for instance, because of sudden rise of resistance, a much lower um, uptake and bring the revenues under the 100 million um, threshold. So based on these ideas, you can formulate many alternative um, interventions or incentives if you want. And some of this could be modeled by our um, by the kind of model that we developed for our uh, report. In particular, we could check alternative distribution settings. And some of this would be very relevant for diagnostics, such as including also uh, philanthropic or donor supported um, sale, um, installation of these machines. Or we could also explore with this kind of modeling, the alternative of pooling demands between different countries or changing the reimbursement systems. But if we really want to take a full step towards completing new incentives, we would need to uh, change also the basic model, for instance, to model fully delinked pool mechanisms, as will be mentioned later on today. We will need to build different models as we are still bound with the kind of analysis that you see in this report to the world where revenues derives from um, yeah, price times units sold. So thank you very much so far. And I hand it over to the uh, moderator who has probably joined us at this point. No. <laughs> no, okay. Yes, she cannot join, but um, we have talked with Kevin in the meantime. He will take over the moderation. So I will go back in the background and Kevin will join and then have the first questions and then going ahead with everything. So obviously I am the backup plan behind Kathy Talkington of the Pew Trust. <laughs> um, a lot of questions already, but I, I think the plan as I understand it is that we'll spend a, like a question or two now, and then we'll go on to David and Calm, and then my presentation, and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. But um, looking at the questions in the chat, people please keep adding to those. Um, it, it seems um, that we have almost a neglected disease here, you know, because uh, Colleen, showed clearly um, the global need. Um, Enrico showed that, um, you know, what we need is something on the order of $700 million of, glee, of, of uh, global peak year sales. And uh, how that just, those aren't compatible if we try to raise prices because of all the other implications on global access as well as stewardship. So um, do I have those facts right? And is in fact what we're looking at here the need for a pull incentive based on value and not volume? Your comments. Well, there is, there is also the other side of the equation here, which would be really to try to transform those uh, needs uh, in uh, societal value. And we didn't really do it with this report, but uh, any amount uh, of a pull incentive would be nothing compared to the uh, huge societal value for this kind of products. So it should be really the value that these products can generate for humanity that should motivate this kind of uh, interventions, in my view. And Clean, do I, do I hear you right that, that the global need and the global impact would be, would be tremendous, but it's mainly located or, or uh, disproportionately located in low and middle income countries and therefore the market is just not reflecting it. Do I understand you right? That is absolutely correct. So the biggest need is going to be in low and middle income countries who, as we know right now, do not necessarily contribute or access the, the newest uh, the newest kids um, on the block as far as the antibiotic market. So this is where the biggest need is going to be. It's not to say that high income countries are going to be perfectly safe, um, but the rate of increase is going to be slower. And as absolute numbers 
the, num the total number of patients in high income countries with this specific need are going to be significantly smaller than those in, in low and middle income countries. And I think if we've learned anything from COVID, and I'm not sure that we have learned anything yet, but uh, it would be that none of us are safe until everyone is safe. And um, so maybe that's part of the message here. Um, so with that, I think um, we'll go on uh, and we'll have more time for questions of all the speakers at the end. But next up, uh, David Glover and, and Colin Leonard are from NHS England and, and UK NICE are going to describe uh, the world famous uh, UK pilot program. Over to you. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, some my colleague David is here. Uh, ah, here we go. Here's David. Okay. Off you go, David. David's going to start. Thanks, Colin. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear. Just waiting for the slides to come up. But uh, thank you for inviting us today. Uh, Colin and I. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, NHS and NICE project, uh, which is looking at developing and testing innovative models for the evaluation and purchase of <coughs> antimicrobials. And apologies for anybody who picks up that the date on the slide is wrong. Um, so let me first just introduce myself. Uh, I'm David Glover. I'm an economic advisor at NHS England and Improvement. And Colm is a consultant clinical advisor to NICE, and he is the lead clinical, uh, he's the clinical lead for our project. Um, and these are the four kind of main themes that we're going to talk to you today. A uh, bit of an overview, the selection process that we use for our project, uh, and then a little bit about the evaluation framework and a bit about the payment model. So next up is uh, the overview. So our aim is to develop and test an innovative payment model that reimburses companies for antimicrobials based primarily on their value. So hopefully this fits on quite well from uh, what Enrico was saying. Uh, value to the NHS as opposed to the volumes used. Uh, and in terms of success criteria for the project, uh, we're looking to have an agreed HTA evaluation framework uh, and complete uh, a real kind of uh, test of that value assessment for two products. Uh, to also have a payment framework that uh, leads to successful negotiations uh, of payments for those two products, which uh, also supports good stewardship. Uh, and the other success criteria is we, we're trying to engage with other countries uh, through um, uh, presentations like this uh, to try to achieve pull incentives from microbials and stimulate companies to increase investments. So we recognise basically that um, our project on its own within England and the UK is not is not going to deliver the outcome. We need everybody to kind of pull together on this. Uh, and the findings from the project will be used to inform the future policy in this area. So we're going to look how we can take this kind of one-off project into something that can be used routinely. So just to give you a little bit of the timeline. Project uh, was developed during 2019 and early 2020. Uh, and then in June 2020, we launched a procurement process and invited companies to put themselves forward. And by December 2020, uh, we'd selected the two products on which we are now testing this process. Uh, this includes finalizing the contractual terms with them and awarding a provisional contract. Uh, and now the evaluation process, which started in January 2021, with uh, the NICE committee expected uh, to meet and issue their report towards the end of this year or early next year. Um, and then we'll, I'll say more about that in a few moments. Uh, and then this will lead to the final sort of commercial discussions between NHS England as the purchaser and the companies uh, with the payment schedule hopefully to start in April or spring next year. So that's our timeline. Just for those uh, who aren't aware, these are the two products that we've selected. And this is where I always embarrass myself for my lack of pharmaceutical knowledge and pronunciation. Um, but Kefidericol is the Shinogi product, which has been on the market for a short time. And Keftazidine with Avabactam is the Pfizer product, uh, which has been on the market a little bit more. And we deliberately chose those that sort of differentiation between them. So as part of our process, we can test the evidence base that we need in order to do for NICE to do their evaluation. So now to the selection process itself. 
Um, so this was designed specifically for this project and involves a formal procurement tender with a contract for supply. This is not normal for medicines uh, in the UK, where normally we purchase packs of tablets or vials like anywhere else, which is bought by pharmacies in the wholesale market um, and, and just a pack price paid. So the development of this process involved engagement with industry, including a industry government joint working group. The selection criteria for the products uh, formed part of the procurement process itself. Companies submitted their evidence that they met those criteria in uh, June, uh, following the launch of the process. And then this was followed up uh, in August to December last year with detailed dialogue discussions between the NHS and those companies to work out the sort of contract details uh, and get us to that place where we have a model contract. Uh, the winning applicants were then announced in December, as I've already mentioned. So a bit more on the selection process. Uh, fell into two main categories. The first of these we called qualification requirements. And these were more about the companies rather than the products. Um, so the qualification criteria are common to all public sector contracts in the UK and designed to make sure that the company is not doing something illegal uh, or they're unlikely to become bankrupt during um, the course of the contract period. Um, as mentioned earlier, we do have a specific requirement about how long the product has been on the market in the UK in order for us to test that evidential need. Um, we are aware that some of the qualification criteria is kind of quite restrictive at the moment and supports our larger companies rather than SMEs, um, which is problematic when a lot of the development work is done by SMEs. So I think when we're going into the future, we'll need to look around to make sure that we support uh, all countries. Um, but I'm now gonna, well, sorry, I've skipped a slide there. I'm now gonna hand over to Colin, who's gonna say a little bit more uh, about the selection criteria. Great, thanks, David. Um, well, the qualification criteria were particularly about the companies and, and the, the marketing authorization they achieved. The selection requirements were much more specific about um, picking um, two antimicrobials. We only had two slots, so we wanted to focus very much on picking two products where that were addressing a, an unmet need, and we used a very um, transparent scoring process that scored um, candidate products against whether they addressed uh, priority pathogens on the World Health Organization uh, list, and um, also whether that there was a level of UK unmet need, um, for how they performed against some of the key determinants of antimicrobial resistance in the UK, like the genotypes of carbapenemase resistance, and also factoring in um, whether their usage was in a, a severe clinical setting uh, within the, the marketing authorization. And we also had some um, uh, novelty, um, if you like, points awarded. Uh, companies had to show that there would be surety of supply. Um, they also had to show past and planned behavior around antimicrobial stewardship and past and planned future behavior around surveillance. And there was also a cost element that uh, as part of the scoring, um, the yeah, public contracts is a requirement that there's a, a cap on the cost and um, so uh, we came up with a, a maximum payment of, of 10 million pounds per product per year for up to 10 years but um, David will talk more about that um, later. Um, so talking now more about the evaluation framework and um, David's touched on the, the, the timeline um, as he mentioned by December last year we had picked the two products, but we also had draft scopes for the evaluation that were finalized by February. Um, the economic evaluation by the academic groups in, in York and Sheffield started in uh, you know, the early part of the year and they published their protocols in March and companies had to submit um, their uh, evidence um, by June this year. And uh, now currently we're coming to the end of the economic evaluation process, which has included a lot of expert input from clinicians, as well as obviously the health ec economic um, modelers, but also uh, expert elicitation. And those reports are due to be submitted um, to NICE on the two products um, by the end of September, and um, with NICE committee meetings scheduled for November with um, draft guidance then at the end of this year. We, there are some resource um, 
issues at the moment with the economic evaluation team. So those timelines may slip a little bit, but we're hoping that it won't impact on the overall timeline, which David commented on with commercial payments in place by the end of the first quarter next year. Um, so it's important to say this is, um, NICE has a long history of carrying out health technology assessments or appraisals. It's very important to note the difference between our standard appraisal, which you see on the left-hand side, where NICE effectively produces guidance on whether a product is cost-effective and gives a yes or no to the system in terms of whether the product can be used. And um, if NICE says yes, it's, it's based on a cost per quality adjusted life year, and that is a, an assessment of the direct health benefit uh, to patients. And um, if NICE say yes to a product with the standard appraisal mechanism, the funding is mandatory um, using the price proposed by the manufacturer. This, this pro project is very different because the NICE committee will not be saying yes or no. They will be commenting on a plausible range of value of the new antimicrobial and also identifying the stewardship strategy that should be used. And that um, plausible range is a plausible range where possible of qualities estimating the population net health benefit. So in this project, we're not just um, assessing the quality gains um, that uh, directly affect patients. Um, we're also assessing additional attributes of value beyond the benefits to the patient. And those additional attributes of value um, have been given the steady acronym spectrum transmission enablement diversity and insurance value. And um, to talk about those briefly, a spectrum of course refers to, you know, if a specific narrow spectrum antimicrobial comes to market that spares the use of more broader spectrum antibiotics that may have benefits for antimicrobial resistance. Transmission value, of course, refers to an ability of an antimicrobial to reduce the chances of a, a patient infected with a resistant bug infecting others. Enablement, and um, perhaps in some ways, is one of the biggest values of an antimicrobial because it allows all sorts of medical therapies and surgical therapies and transplants, which would not be possible without, um, uh, sorry, the slide seems to slip forward, which would not be possible um, without um, uh, antimicrobials, and, and not just for the individual patients with resistance, but for other patients. Um, diversity value, of course, refers to the fact that if you're just dependent on one antimicrobial for a particular bloodstream infection or pneumonia, then you're going to develop resistance to that fairly quickly. So there's benefits from having a diverse range of antimicrobials available. And of course, there's also an insurance value for antimicrobials that uh, having a, an antibiotic on the shelf ready for a situation where there's a dramatic increase in resistance or the emergence of a resistant bug. Um, so there are, of course, challenges around modeling um, antimicrobials um, with novel methodology that goes beyond direct benefits to patients. They, they have broad marketing authorizations. It would be equivalent to multiple standard appraisals if we modeled everything for each of the two antibiotics. And also, these additional attributes of value beyond the individual patient benefits are overlapping and, and quite challenging to model with certainty and um, dealing with uncertainty, not just around those attributes of value, but also around um, expected usage and emergence of resistance has its own challenges and the evidence base is very uncertain. And standard care, we've certainly had that driven home to us thus far and um, that standard care varies tremendously across hospitals. So we've had to take a pragmatic approach where we realized we would spend even more years doing this if we tried to, um, you know, acutely model every single possible usage of these antimicrobials. We've had to be pragmatic. We've had to pick um, what are, in some ways, an unhelpful term of high value clinical scenarios where we had evidence and data available, but also those scenarios being supported by um, healthcare specialists as being important to the system. That Those high value clinical scenarios will be subjected to the detail economic modeling, but we're not saying that other usages are not important. Well, far from it. We're saying that, of course, we're aware there are other usages outside these high value, and we will try and uh, have a commentary and a narrative on those that are a mix of the published evidence, expert opinion, and extrapolation from the high value clinical scenarios. And this is a busy slide. It's, I don't really want to go through it in detail, but what I'm trying to show here is that for both antimicrobials, the Kazavi and Kifidrical, we defined 
um, high value clinical scenarios based on either a risk based empiric approach where patients were felt to have high risk of um, a resistant bug that might need these antimicrobials in a hospital cord pneumonia or, or ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, but also, um, we modeled um, microbiology directed treatment where there's a confirmed um, if you like, susceptibility or, or resistance element that makes one or other of these antibiotics the preferred choice. And that uh, was picked as being in complicated urinary tract infections. So we've had to be very pragmatic in this project because of timeliness. And um, this would be the sort of um, the, the, the type of wording that we expect to come out of the, the NICE committee, where the NICE committee will comment on this plausible estimate of the total lifetime value to the NHS in quality adjusted life years where possible. And when uh, these antimicrobials are used within the, the, the stewardship and marketing authorization requirements, and that will be estimated for um, the, the, the sort of the, the annual value for the duration of the contract up to um, sort of 10 years. And, um, and then it comments, the output will comment on the fact that, um, you know, the discussions will be uh, informed by this output from the committee and to try and achieve de-linked payments. And then they will enter this three-year initial contract with the option of extending to 10 years where the companies will receive an annual value-based payment that we aim to happen by the end of the first quarter next year. So I'm going to turn back to David now to talk more about the nitty gritty of the payment models. Um, thank you. Thanks, Colin. Just wait for the slide to move on. Here we go. So here uh, are some features of the payment model itself. So um, as we mentioned already, uh, the payment model to companies means that the, uh, that the companies will be paid uh, for the antimicrobials based on the estimated value of benefits to patients in the NHS, rather than the payments being based on volumes used. Uh, by paying an annual fee, this removes the link between usage and payment while supporting good stewardship. In other words, if hospitals order and use very small volumes in a given year, the company gets paid the same amount per year as if uh, the hospital had ordered and used much larger volumes. For the project, the annual uh, value has been capped at uh, £10 million per antimicrobial. Um, the exact amount will depend on the output from the NICE committee uh, that Colin has just discussed. Um, and just for the, the avoidance of that doubt, we kind of we had to put in a cap uh, at this stage of the process in order to kind of move it forward because of the way uh, contract regulations work. Um, but we'll be looking to take the lessons that we can from this project and inform what are the typical sort of value range that we should be expecting uh, when we move this uh, into the sort of uh, routine environment. Um, so. That's kind of where we're, we're looking at, um, and we are on tender hooks really to see what the uh, assessment value is going to come up with in the next few months. Uh, just move on to the next slide. Uh, so, as already said, it's a subscription type payment model. Uh, that cap is at £10 million per year per product. The initial contract period is for three years and is extendable up to another seven to make 10 in total. Um, so three years is, is our kind of trial period to make sure it works. And then if we get to that routine uh, commissioning place, we'll be able, sorry, the slides just moved on there. We'll be able to kind of migrate uh, people from one uh, to the other. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. But they're, they're guaranteed for three years and then we can extend to seven under the current contract. Uh, there is a pressure relief mechanism. So that if volumes do get, if you know, we, we have some sort of need for enormous volumes and the company feels under pressure for this unfair, we do have the ability to have discussions with company about um, additional payments. For example, if we want to do some stockpiling as we have done under, under COVID. Um, the hospital price, the purchase price will be different from this price. So we've, we've done some negotiations. So what we've tried to do is make the list price that hospitals will pay um, comparable to other anti-bacterial uh, treatment options so that the decision to treat is based purely on the, the clinical uh, decision rather than a financial one. Uh, so hopefully again that will support stewardship. Apologies for the, for the slides moving on. Uh, there's a limited number of, of uh, performance criteria within the contract and this is mainly around security of supply to make sure that the companies uh, 
uh, can supply the product um, to hospitals when they need them uh, and that they're delivered on time. So this involves minimum stock holdings within the companies. Um, and then there's some issues around stewardship, manufacturing, environment, surveillance requirements. Um, so, for example, uh, on the environment, um, that they, they comply with uh, AMR Alliance about uh, not contaminating and release of discharge from manufacturing facilities. Surveillance requirements is around anything that they become aware of resistant path, pathogen uh, changes in other countries that they inform us and that we can, we can act from an informed position. So that more or less brings us to the end of our slides and what we want to say. Um, so I think maybe if I hand back to you, Kevin, as the moderator, we're happy to take any questions. Uh, that's right. And if you could uh, unshare your screen so that I can jump in for the next one. So there's a lot of questions. I'll ask the speakers, uh, Enrico has done this once, uh, to try to reply to some of them in the chat because we, we won't have time to get to all of them. But uh, the one question I'm going to have for the two of you came, came from Mark Gitzinger uh, with his hat from Biversus, but maybe also the Beam Alliance. Uh, some of the uh, the processes of the application seem to make it more difficult or weren't attuned to small uh, you know enterprises. And we know that a lot of the innovations coming out of small companies. Uh, you know, can you speak to how that might be improved next time uh, if this pilot is successful and goes forward? Yeah, I think that's if, if it's the commercial side, that's probably a bit for me rather than Colin. So, um, so we're we're very aware of of the limitations that our approach had for the first um, for the pilot round, that it made it difficult for SMEs, particularly to um, be able to show their their financial security and viability, particularly if they haven't had many sales in the past. Um, so uh, we are looking at uh, and working. Um, so the, the, the sort of the way in which public sector contracts work in the UK, it's kind of overseen by central government, by um, uh, what's known as the Cabinet Office in England. Um, so we are in discussions with them about what um, flexibilities they have around SMEs. So we don't have any announcements about what that will be at the moment, but what we can say is we're aware of the difficulties and we're working on how we can make it more appropriate for a wider range of companies. All right, and I'm going to try to share my screen if I can maximize that. Is that working reasonably well for everybody? Yeah, okay. I can see. It. Yeah, yeah I, I know that we're um we I appreciate everyone's patience with uh, our technical issues today. So I'm going to present next, and then I think uh, Kayleen is going to um, moderate uh, the question at the end of mine, <laughs> if that's all right for everyone. All right, so um, what can we learn from uh, various polling centers around the world? And of course, this is these are my opinions. I'm a professor that doesn't necessarily reflect Carvax or any of the funders of Carvax. Um, we just heard from David and Colm about enablement value, one of the five uh, values that the NHS England and NICE are going to pay for antibiotics not based on volume. And this slide gives you an example of the enablement value of antibacterials. You know, a lot of modern medicine is made possible because of antibiotics. Uh, but as we all know, and this slide is actually taken from the Pew Charitable Trust, thank you, Kathy. Uh, the only way I've modified it though is that unfortunately, since this slide was originally made, I've had to add a new um, goose egg uh, on the far right for 2020, that we still don't have a new class discovered that's been approved by a major regulatory authority uh, against gram negatives. So huge need, huge value, uh, complete mismatch. The result is that it messes up um, the economics of it entirely. This is a, a huge economic issue. Everyone on this call um, understands and appreciates this, but this is from a paper out in the last uh, few weeks, uh, clinical infectious diseases with several of us on it. Uh, we looked at, the, at all of the uh, new molecular entity systemic antibacterials approved uh, by four major regulatory agencies in the, in the past decade. Kevin, just to notice, I think you think that um, people see your shared screen, but we have your presentation in our system. So oh you my should, goodness. You should click in the system. So we have your system on the screen and you can click right away there. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for interrupting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you can see that the white space on this chart is bad news. 
it means that uh, the drug has not been commercially launched in these countries. And uh, the countries we looked at for the study were the G7 and seven other high income countries in Europe. And so if we care about global access, which we must, um, but these drugs are not even being commercially launched in these wealthy countries, uh, then, then certainly we have a severe issue here. And, and I'll just note that, um, that for many of these European countries, you see that there's been a, a, an approval, a, an EMA approval. Uh, so approved by the European Medicines Agency, but still not commercially launched uh, because the cost of going that extra step uh, and launching the country, given the low reimbursement, is just too daunting. Uh, I note that Sweden comes out here uh, looking very, uh, very good. Uh, and four of those uh, drugs that uh, made Sweden look better were the result of their um, of their new uh, access pilot, which is uh, which is an awesome result for them. So I'm going to look at these seven pull incentives and uh, and give them uh, a closer look. And you know, really, what I want to say is that um, we need to evaluate them in some ways. And I want to make sure that we focus on high quality drugs, drugs that really meet an unmet need. Uh, delinkage is important. Um, you know, this we've talked about this concept. We understand why paying for value not for volume, is an is a important thing in this sector. Whatever process we use, um, I want it to be transparent. Uh, I want the companies, before they start spending money on clinical development, so right at IND, for them to have a good sense of what the target is. You know, will I qualify for this amazing new pool award? Um, they need to find that out or have a good sense of that um, early so that they can raise money and so that we put through clinical development, the types of programs that will actually uh, receive the pool award and not have uh, nasty surprises that, oh, we, we don't actually want your type of drug that you just spent five or seven years clinically developing. The uh, pool instead of must be large enough to make a difference. Um, it also, the rich countries need to pay each their fair share. Um, and to the extent we can, we need this to be easy to administrate it can't disrupt what's going on in terms of reimbursement within existing health systems, or at least we have to minimize that because uh, you, you touch a third rail of, of politics if you, if you do that. So going through them, I'm not going to say anything about the, the NHS uh, England program because David and Colm just talked about it with one exception. The final bullet point is that um, there's an article that, uh, that it will come out in Health Affairs next month uh, which I've been working on for, it seems like, forever. And uh, I, I look at the estimated global size of a pool incentive. And uh, my conclusion there is that the UK system um, is within the range of an effective global pool incentive. The UK is pairing, pulling its weight, paying its fair share uh, within that process. So look for that article next month. Uh, the Swedish Access Pilot, or maybe I should call it a program, uh, five antibiotics have gone into it. Four of them are on that list of, uh, of new antibiotics for the past decade. Um, it's partially delinked. It's a revenue guarantee uh, paid at the national level, and then as sales increase, there's, there's the possibility that sales within Sweden will exceed that amount. The, the amount of that revenue guarantee is really quite low. It's 4 million Swedish kroner, uh, depending on the exchange rate, you know, 400,000 to 450,000 US dollars per drug per year. So it's not an R&D incentive, but it is a highly effective uh, incentive to, to get access to an already approved drug into Sweden. Uh, what would it take for Sweden to scale this program up and to, to match uh, the UK's program on a, you know, on a fair share basis based on the relative size of the Swedish and the UK economies? It's something on the order of two to three million dollars per drug per year. So still, you know, quite a, an achievable figure, I would think. European reimbursement reforms, um, you know, these get into the weeds of how countries uh, reimburse for antibiotics. Uh, these are both very positive steps. It is very difficult, though, to know how this will actually move revenues because we still have, uh, you know, DRGs, bundled payments in place. We still have stewardship, which is a great thing in place. And if you look at other countries' experience with some things similar to this, for example, the U.S. 
NTAPs, new technology iodine payments, uh, you might wonder just how large the impact will be. And it's not delinked at all. It's still entirely based on volume. So good news, positive news, uh, but, uh, but some limits as well. The European Commission, very exciting that uh, it's this core piece of the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. Um, there's a tender that's publicly available. Uh, you know, groups are hopefully are busy um, putting that, their responses together and, and we'll know in relatively short order uh, which group will be leading this work. And then on a relatively short time frame, uh, there'll be a recommendation for the, to the commission and to the countries on how to adopt a pool incentive that is functional and effective across Europe. So mainly in this slide, it's stay tuned and, and stay engaged in that process. DISARM is a US proposal, it's not passed. Uh, it's similar in some ways to the European and you know the French and German reimbursement reforms. Uh, Alan Carr, uh, now at BARDA, but formerly at Needham, while he was still at Needham, uh, made an estimate of what he thought the impact might be in the United States. Uh, it is not delinked, it's entirely dependent on the volume of sales. Um, and uh, and it, like I said, it's not been enacted into law in the US. Pasteur, a lot of discussion about this. A uh, very small number of antibiotics would, would, uh, would qualify, very large payouts to those. It's a subscription. You can think of this as a US adaptation of uh, the UK model adapted to our system. And it's a fully delinked. It's a prepaid subscription for all US uh, government uses. The last one on my list is the BARDA Project BioShield. This is a biodefense program, uh, not the part of, uh, not the program that funds us directly at CARBEX, but um, it's a discretionary agency action. It's limited to biodefense pathogens. It's a large number and Paratech is grateful for it. But uh, it's paid so that they can do certain things. Uh, they can fund phase four studies, uh, make deliveries to the strategic national stockpile. Um, it's helpful, but it's not actually designed to, to pay uh, the R&D investors who brought this product to market to give them uh, a cash out return. Um, it is fully delinked though. There's, it's not tied to volumes of sales. There's deliveries to the stockpile, but, uh, but the deliveries are what triggers the, the payment, not actual utilization. So here's the payoff slide on all those. I, I've taken this and, and tried to apply uh, three of the issues that I talked about at the beginning of uh, ways that, to evaluate these, and you can add others as well, and tried to make um, my best guess um, back of the napkin on where things fall out. So the X axis is whether it's delinked and uh, disarm fully dependent on volumes, European reimbursement reforms the same, so it's not delinked. On the far right, Pasteur, UK pilot, part of Project BioShield, those are fully delinked, not dependent on revenues. The Swedish I put in the middle because it's a guarantee and, and if sales exceed a certain amount, then it becomes delinked at that point. On the Y-axis, um, TPP, the target product profile, are we sending a clear, transparent signal to the developers, okay? Uh, disarm, the answer is yes, because anything as a qualified infectious disease product, or in other words, almost anything, will qualify. So you know that you're in. Whatever Disarm gives you, you know you'll have it. Um, uh, you know, it's just clear. Hopefully the same would be for Pasteur, at least the way the legislation is drafted today. That's the intent. For the European reimbursement reforms, I put it a little bit lower because, you know, while they, they're they're welcome and helpful and and uh, and moving in the good direction, I don't know if very many product developers in the preclinical and space, um, you know, have done an internal analysis as to whether what they're working on would qualify for these European and, and German uh, uh, and French programs. I'll just to say that the size of the bubble is the, the plausible 10-year economic impact, uh, how much money would flow for, for each drug under it. And then at the bottom of the, of the y-axis, you see TPP less clear at, uh, at the IND stage. And, you know, BARDA is focused on bioterror pathogens, um, but it's, it's hard to know years in advance which program is going to receive a BioShield contract. And, and I give a higher intermediate uh, qualification for, for the UK pilot and for the Swedish access programs. Uh, maybe over time, uh, we have 
two examples from the UK. We have five from Sweden. Maybe over time, and as, as these you know, the workings are, are more publicly available, uh, we'll be we'll know better what these look like, and, and they'll move up higher up uh, the y-axis. So that's my overview of what we have uh, in the world in terms of uh, pull incentives. And, uh, and I hope you can see uh, some of the factors that I think are important. Let's make it large enough. Let's make it administratable. Let's make it delinked. Let's make it clear so that the companies who are doing this work um, can see what the target is. And then I'm fairly certain they will try hard to, to hit that target. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So uh, there are some questions already for you in the chat. Um, May I uh, first take Enrico's question? Um, so he mentioned that you have uh, five very important features of pull incentives. Um, what are your thoughts about adding a time frame? Um, specifically, asking how long do you think uh, those pull incentives should be applied? Yeah. So my personal opinion is that it really should cover the entire patent period. I, I know that we focused on ten years, uh, you know, and that's that's been what it's been discussed, but. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't cover the full patent period. And honestly, once the drug goes generic, uh, we also have a reason to offer a much smaller subscription to make sure that the supply chain of that drug remains active and robust. Thank you. Um, and I'll also take the, um, the other question for you specifically um, on the use of um, effective surveillance data um, to help guide R&D that are also useful for policymaker and clinicians. So specific, specifically asking about models with stronger um, partnerships at the level of um, clinicians, academia, and private, um, public-private partnerships and cooperation. So uh, I, I lost the thread a little bit on the question. If you could try one more time. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so the question uh, specifically um, is asking about your thoughts about a model that has stronger um, partnerships with the clinical side, with the academic side, with private uh, sector, as well as the public sector. So uh, I'll answer two ways. I think any large pool incentive that, that is paid, you know, after the regulatory approval will, will help everybody earlier in the R&D ecosystem. So if, if there's a billion dollar or $2 billion global pool incentive paid uh, for this amazing drug, then suddenly there'll be much more private capital investing in the clinical and the preclinical spaces and, and academic groups will be more incentivized to spin out their ideas to the small companies. I think all the way back down the line, it helps tremendously. Another way to answer your question, and maybe I misunderstood it, is that I think the patient voice, making sure that we, you know, listen to and, and meet the actual clinical need around the world is vital. If we set standards that don't do that, then shame on us. Uh, we have an opportunity here to, to, to bring amazing drugs to market that can meet patient needs. We have to design the targets so that they actually achieve that. Um, it would be a disaster for us if we brought you know, gave the first global pool incentive rewards uh, to a drug that turned out to to be a lemon. You know, in in retrospect. So um, now, Celine and I are going to try to. Kaylin and I are going to try to um, co-moderate now. So I see a question that's really for our UK friends. Um, it's from Martin Bott. Um, you know, you're focused on quality. Um, shouldn't there be a a broader societal piece there, and and and, and I'll ask a, a second piece there. What happens if the quality thing coming back from the committee says the value to the UK is a hundred million, uh, but you're only going to pay ten? You know, there's a cap on it. Um, and then one final piece to put that all together. There was a comment earlier. I forgot who it was from. Uh, you're focused on UK needs. Uh, what, what if the drug is just uh, has a modest use in the UK, but has an amazing impact on on India or, or the rest of the world? David, do you want to touch on the uh, quality question, and then I can yeah, touch on I, the, the, to, and the yeah. 
there's, there's a, I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, there's an ongoing debate, not just around paying for antimicrobials in the UK with its HCA system, the degree to which it should incorporate societal, wider society benefits is the term we use in the UK, uh, into the value assessment for, for all medicines, whether it's antibiotics or not. Um, and to some extent, we're being guided by where that debate is. Um, if you're thinking at it from a payer's perspective, um, you don't want to actually capture absolutely every value element of value within the amount that you're paying companies. Companies would love that, of course. And, and in this case, we are looking to expand the value that companies get. But if you captured absolutely every element of value and gave it to the company, and if you're just thinking in purely economic terms and you put the health side, to put the health aspect to one side, then uh, in economic language, you become indifferent as to whether we'd want to purchase that product if we put absolutely every bit of value into the price. So in order to create a kind of a win-win situation, you want to have some society benefit as well that kind of goes to society and doesn't just accrue to the company. Um, so that's my little bit of economics hat on, but it does get into the politics of just how much we should pay and there is an ongoing debate. So um, that's, that's my answer to that, that question. Great, and then just um, jumping into it's a very good question around um, the, the commenting on that. Um, you, you sort of well, we focused on the UK on that need and how that might be different elsewhere and how that would impact. Well, we have a, a weighted scoring system that actually gave the the highest um, scores to um, products that uh, um, address the. The, 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 the top tier of priority pathogens on the World Health Organization list. So we weren't just focusing on UK need, but layered underneath that, um, a key UK unmet need has been increasing problems with gram-negative resistant bloodstream infections. And of course, that's also very much included in the high priority pathogens in the WHO list. Um, and also, the WHO pipeline report, um, if you like, very much um, supported our focus for this particular project on resistant gram-negative infections because that last WHO report very much focused on the relatively poor pipeline and commented on specifically not just resistant gram-negative infections, but the relative lack of products active against metallobeta-lactamase mechanism of resistance. So we weren't just doing something that was um, potentially only UK focused. It was also in selecting our two products, the scoring reflected things that were really important internationally also. Um, I, I see a question uh, for me about other countries. I, I am aware of discussions about pull incentives in Japan. I am not aware of uh, you know, serious government level discussions in India, China, or Brazil. They could be happening, but uh, I'm just personally not aware of them. Um, I'd be interested in questions uh, from the small companies um, about any of this. What, what do you need? Um, if you can pop that into the chat. And Kaleen, I, I don't know if you have a question for anyone in the group. Um. So actually I do um, think that was a question that was started earlier on, um, talking a little bit about the societal benefit, the environmental benefit, et cetera, of this whole discussion. Um, so anybody has any thoughts about how to account for the actual societal value, maybe antibiotics as a global public good as well? I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm particularly qualified to comment on it. I'm a, I'm, I spend half my time as a clinician seeing patients um, when I'm not working with lives. But I think in some fashion, we're indirectly having hopefully some environmental benefits because while there were certain reasons we couldn't specifically score companies on their performance against the AMOR benchmark, um, we used the same headings um, ask the AMOR benchmark and the kind of things the AMOR Industry Alliance use. So in those, um, you know, holding companies to the wire in terms of their 
manufacturing and um, the producers of the APIs and, and discharge into the environment and so on. I think there could be potential benefits if these types of contract um, you know, were used across the world. It sends a signal that at least in, in terms of the environmental impact um, on, on, on the environment from manufacturing, there could be benefits from um, our approach if it's in some way adopted or adapted by other countries. And of course, um, yeah, if, 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 if antibiotics are able to be held on the shelf in reserve rather than used more actively because companies can recoup their investment because of these dealing payments, in theory, that could further facilitate um, um, sort of a more stewardship and less emergence of resistance and, and then therefore less use of antibiotics against resistant bugs which have environmental impacts. Maybe just a quick follow-up question. Do you think that those uh, very interesting points should be included um, in models, in incentives, um, et cetera, or should be factored in? Yeah, so I mean, again, um, I mean, David, uh, normally we, I think we, we share a link of, sort of all the, 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 um, the, the um, documents from our project, including the draft contracts and scoring system. I think the simple answer is that, that yes, I think that certainly Dame Sally, who's been one of not just the national, but international advocates, Dame Sally Davies um, from the UK, at the start of this project, she was very keen that we we make it very clear that companies, if they expect delinked payments, that they must also be expected to have the highest levels of behavior around manufacturing and stewardship and surveillance. And I think so that should be, in my view, um, sort of, and, and I think Pasteur will uh, presumably have those kinds of options also, but I guess I'm not particularly well placed to comment on that, but hopefully and Pasteur and other uh, innovations will, will use similar approaches. I think the answer is yes, uh, and, and Pasteur. It, it gives the, the countries that lead with the subscription model, it, it gives you the ability by contract with that company uh, to really do excellent things, not only for environmental and, and production, but also for stewardship and access, as well as supply chain continuity and, and the whole nine yards. It's, you know, we can achieve a contract what probably would be impossible by regulation. It's um, several people uh, have uh, jumped at my request, and small company folks have asked questions. I'm going to read a couple of them, and then ask any of the panelists to respond. So David Tordup says, uh, "What can small medium enterprises do at the early stage in terms of evidence development to prepare for eventual value assessment by NICE, but also by any pool mechanism? You know, they need." They know what they might need to get approval at FDA or EMA. How will they know what they're going to need from these pull incentives, the evidence package? Great question. Mark Getzinger asks, uh, for SMEs, early clarity of eligibility criteria, size, uh, and the Swedish model doesn't really help the R&Ds side for, for small and medium enterprises, how fast it's going to go because these folks have to plan and have to raise money. And, and Pete Jackson, um, you know, is there a chance for an earlier milestone, uh, something that, you know, and, and and I guess he's thinking about the completion of a phase two trial or something um, in order to uh, allow investors, a, you know, a quicker exit. Um, any of those questions from any of the panelists? Kevin, can I, can I jump in and comment? So in, in England, currently, for the health technology assessment process, NICE publishes what's known as a methods guide as to uh, what evidence requirements and how you do the modelling of the health economic benefits of the product. The purpose of the work that uh, Colm and NICE are doing now in terms of the uh, for antibiotics is to amend that process to have uh, an addendum which will be specific to antibiotics. Oh. That's a little bit early in the stage to, to promise anything in terms of what actually is going to be published. But I would, I would imagine that once, once we get to uh, being able to do this for the routine, there will be uh, an additional document published, which will set out for companies what they need to do in terms of uh, getting their products assessed. Yeah, I think that that's a really um, good comment. And I think that, you know, again, David emphasized this, and I'm not sure I touched on it, but 
you know, the particular criteria were very specific to this project. We had really, really significant constraints around the procurement legislation framework we had to follow, and we had only two slots to to look at. And you know, one could argue that you know, antibiotics that have oral as well as IV options or avoid the need for IV options and allow people to be treated at home, uh, where currently they might need you know um, hospital treatment will be should be valued um, at some level or other. And so, yeah, the aim is that we would have a set of eligibility criteria for the UK. But I think in, in a fashion, you know, the, the WHO pipeline report is kind of part way there in terms of how it helps to highlight the gaps and, and what's in the pipeline and, and where the key areas that need more work. But I think it would be really good to have internationally agreed, not just UK agreed, eligibility criteria because those requirements may vary from country to country even within the UK there are different demographics around some of the carbapenemase resistance mechanisms and obviously certain resistance mechanisms are higher in some European countries than others and obviously we know that low and middle income countries have particular issues around things like you know gram negatives and acinetobacter that and we don't have a big issue around acinetobacter in the UK so yeah I think we need some sort of international approach to sort of target product profiles that might be rewarded with incentives they may need to be tweaked for individual countries particular on that needs i think there has to be some flexibility uh, sandra tells me we have about three or four minutes um and uh, i think enrico was waving his hand so uh, he may have a comment <clears throat> yeah it's uh, actually a comment to the question by pete jackson concerning milestone based rewards and uh, in a previous work for the uh, Swedish Public Health Agency, with colleagues, we made some simulation and we could demonstrate uh, that uh, some kind of amount between 10 and $20 million given at the end of phase two would have a huge impact in revamping the pipeline. So th these are not probably so broadly discussed, but a smaller amount given in the early steps, uh, also interesting for owners that do not want to continue until market launch would still motivate uh, many companies to continue and be attracted to small companies who sometimes only plan to license out the products uh, after phase two or something. So there is a uh, mathematical evidence, but uh, I'm afraid there is not much uh, going on in terms of uh, um, engineering this type of uh, uh, tools. And, and uh, on the comments that were just made too about uh, the UK process, and, and I see Mark Getzinger had another question about, please, let's have one process for Europe, not 27. Um, <laughs> um, you know, harmonization uh, will be valuable. We've talked about regulatory harmonization for decades, but uh, it, would, it would be best if there was a single European process and a single European application. And then a, a small company would only have to worry about UK, US, uh, Japan, and, and the single European application. And hopefully those folks would get together and harmonize so that a similar or identical package worked for all of them. Um, if I was a small company, that's what I would hope for. Um, we only have a minute or two. Uh, Kayleen, do you have any final words? And then we'll give anyone a chance to give a final word. Um, I don't think so. I think the discussion uh, in the chat has been uh, very interesting, but most of the comments and questions have been um, have been brought forward. Um, from my standpoint, um, it was also a, a very interesting learning opportunity for me. I come from the epi side of things, uh, so certainly was glad to participate and, and hear from uh, all the experts. Thank you. Hello, so then. Great to to have this uh, this discussion here running about uh, everything around those uh, currently established uh, pool incentives and thank you all for for being here on and for having answered uh, the questions and for being in the in the chat and then uh, hopefully you can stay for the for the next part then so um, we will have another discussion more directed uh, into the future then. So I say bye to Kevin, Colleen, Colm, Enrico and David.